Okay, where we're starting here is with life in the Paleolithic. And this is, oh, the first 30,000 or so years of human history, and then the lifestyle that a number of people continue to use after that. Okay, just a reminder, we covered this before in being human, but just remember um, adaptation through, through culture. In other words, humans don't evolve or change their physical aspects to live in different environments. Instead, they change their cultures and develop new cultural aspects to live in different environments. What we're talking about here is the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age, and technically that covers pretty much from about two million years ago, where the first hominids show up and start making tools, to about 10,000 years ago. Within that, it's only about 30,000 year, 40,000 years ago, 30,000 after the um, agricultural revolution that we actually have modern humans. Uh, but so if you sort of look at this on the time scale, the bulk of human history is Paleolithic age. Um, and then of course, a much shorter region is the period that comes after agriculture. And of course, the period after the industrial revolution, which we're most familiar with is, is a very brief period of time just in order to keep a memory of Paleolithic, what that means if you run into it, it is literally Old Stone Age. Lith, in the middle of that, L-I-T-H, means stone. So Paleo means Old Stone Age. And then of course what follows it is the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. Everybody began, all humans begin, as foragers or hunter-gatherers, depending on how you want to call them, and that is what they remain for most of human history. Today, however, there are very few people remaining that are foragers or hunter-gatherers, and even those that are, are people who generally also have some contact with farming peoples as well. These are people without many things, um, who may not, depending on the climate, wear many clothes, but these are not stupid people. To survive as a hunter-gatherer, you need highly developed skills and detailed knowledge of the environment. Now the reality is, is that what we're talking about here was a long time ago, and it was before anybody used writing. So we have to speculate based on what we know about from bones, physical remains, and of course since these people were not people who built houses, we have less remains to work with for them, though sometimes we find useful things like tools, garbage dumps, stuff like that. Um, and we also can look at more modern hunter-gatherers that have been seen and known and sort of look at how they managed. But um, once again, that's it's speculation. Educated speculation, but speculation. Okay, center of being a Paleolithic person, center of life as a forager or hunter-gatherer, is the quest for survival. And what's at essence in this is that these are a people with limited amounts of fail-safes. In other words, our society is built around hoarding food. Um, we store it in huge ware warehouses, we fill grain elevators, we have stores of food that we keep. We still may have people in our society who do not get enough to eat, but that's a matter of economics and how we distribute the food within our society. There is never not food in our society that people could be eating, whether or not they have access to it. For hunter-gatherers, they may easily face time without food. Um, and in those cases, they're going to have limited backups because these are not people who can store food um, for the most part, with some exceptions, but mostly food is something that you gather, you hunt, you eat, um, but you don't have a long-term uh, buildup. And so if you face a drought, a bad season, that your animal migration paths change, this could mean starvation for you. Foragers also have to depend on mobility. Um, in, for what they need, they need not so much one or two kinds of plants that they live off of. Usually they depend on a wide variety of food resources. Um, so hunting various animals, 
gathering various plants, possibly fishing at some times of the year, berries at some times of the year, um, all these different kinds of resources that are out there that are probably only available seasonally. So you are going to move as a forager um, from place to place to take advantage of what the environment offers. Now we sometimes see this as having no sense of, of territory or property, but usually for these communities, um, you might your band would probably be associated with a certain territory. Um, but instead of having this concept that you own this piece of land, you keep it all the time, much more likely what would be the case is that you have the right to hunt on this land. It might be where someone else gathers berries. You may have the right to fish here, but at a different time of year, someone else is using it for something else. Um, so, highly mobile people, but they're not just wandering <laughs> randomly, which is, I think, sometimes the image that people have. All of this depends on having a very detailed knowledge of the environment. And if you do not know where the plants grow, if you do not know the seasonal changes and what that means for which animals are going to be where, if you do not know where the fish are going to be running and when, you're dead and your community is dead. Um, so you, you have to have this extremely detailed knowledge of the environment around you. Tools technology. Um, technology in this term for historians uh, means things that tools that we use to make things to do things. And so it doesn't have to be something complex like we're used to thinking about technology as computers and stuff like that. Instead, in this case, it's just simply things like fire, digging sticks. Um, one of the very earliest forms of technology was probably women learning to um, take long grasses, long fibers, and turn them into some kind of rope to make it easier for them to gather large amounts because they can tie it up and make it easier to bring with them. So these very basic kinds of technology are what allows these people to do things. We've, we've probably got a real imbalance in the archaeological record. Women's tools were probably often made from fibers and wood, so things like baskets, things like rope for making it easier to gather things, um, various things like that, and those kinds of things probably disappeared a lot long ago. Men's tools were more likely to be made out of stone, to be made out of bones, um, tools for hunting, tools for those tasks, and so we probably have in the archaeological record a lot more of the men's tools than we do of the women's tools, uh, which probably gives us a somewhat biased version of how things worked. And you've got that little video to watch talking about how people made tools, and I think it's, it's enlightening to look at that, how you simply people would take a, a stone and by developing edges on it and how you use it, you can get something that you can use um, to cut. That's what hand axes are, by the way. I always wondered that hand axes are basically something you use to cut um, a stone with an edge, um, things that you can use to scrape the flesh off the skin so you have the skin available for various tasks. Awls, things to drill holes. Awls are things to drill holes in like a skin if you're going to try to bind it together for some kind of clothing or some kind of other pur purpose. Um, all of these kinds of things. And they're much more sophisticated um, than simply just something, uh, something, you know, just picking up a rock and trying to do things with it. And in fact, believe it or not, Paleolithic peoples, there's some evidence that in some cases they have long distance trade routes because there were certain types of stone that were much better for making tools. And so all the way from Europe to the Middle East, some stones would travel through these inform through these trade routes because of the value of the stone itself. Um, if, if it's something like that, a tool that is very special, there probably was a pretty clear sense of private ownership that this was your tool and it wasn't like everything was share and share alike. Still, by, just keep in mind, despite the fact that these people use tools, they're never going to have a lot of stuff because anything they have, they have to carry with them. And so your sense of what's essential to carry with you is obviously going to be pretty limited. Gathering is what women did. And it's really sort of based on the reality that women expect to carry their children. 
And if they're not carrying them, they're keeping an eye on them. And so whatever tasks they do have to be something that you can be interrupted <laughs> to deal with what's going on with the kids, and then you can get back to it. It can't be something that requires you to move quickly, um, like running or hunting often might. Um, for women, in the gathering they did, brought in probably the majority of the calories that these people depended on. And it's not just picking berries, it's gathering plants, insects in certain areas, digging up roots, maybe even catching small animals in the process of the gathering. Um, in this case, what you're looking at is people in the Kalahari Desert, women are gathering manonga. I'm not going to try to say it, but um, whatever they're doing, and as you can see with these women, they're doing it with their children along with them. Hunting was what men did, and it didn't provide the bulk of the calories uh, because successful hunting was not a routine, everyday occasion. It, however, does bring in rare nutrients so they can survive without it, and also becomes the moments of feast and celebration for the community. I mean, that's when you suddenly have a lot of food to eat and that you can actually celebrate and feast for it. It's also something that we can see its importance uh, to the societies in the places where um, people left records like the cave art, like what we're looking at here. And I don't know how well you can see it, but, you can, but if you look carefully, you can see the sort of throwing sticks or arrows that are being directed at that large creature, which I'm not sure what the creature is, but you get the picture. Hunting was almost always a male occupation, though there is some evidence that maybe in rare occasions some women and some societies may have taken part, um, at least in the Americas. Probably for human beings, men started as, as scavengers, basically. You know, wait until the lions leave their prey behind and da dash in and try to grab as much as you can before the hyenas get it or get you. Um, but over time, humans began to hunt on their own, and they had to depend mostly on stealth. Um, all of their weapons are human-powered, so you had to get quite close to your prey in order to throw a spear or use a throwing stick. Um, and then generally it's based on the fact that that animal would then be wounded, and then you have to chase it down in order to kill it, and hope all the way that the lion isn't going to see what you're doing and take your prey away from you, um, because you really, for the most part, these guys are not going to be able to fight something like that off. And so, you know, that's sort of the end of your feast day. These communities were I, I, um, organized into families and bands um, as a way of sort of social organization. Um, a band would be a small group of families, and living together in a band would provide greater safety, greater security. It allows the men to hunt in groups. Um, it allows the women to work together to bring in more food through gathering. And also, these sort of loose bands would generally have ritual times in which all the different bands in an area would meet up. And you can imagine why that's really important, because if you're living in a band of up to 40 people, when your teenagers get to the age where teenagers are getting ready to split off and marry, um, find partners or whatever, at that point, you need to be in contact with other people, and so that's part of what the whole thing of being getting together um, once a year for a time of celebration means, that you, you get a chance to make contact, you know, you have a chance to look for possible spouses, and, and you have a chance to see your family back in another band. And sometimes people will even switch bands at those types of times. These groups, according to most anthropologists or historians, prehistorians, probably it's not that violence was unknown, but it was much more likely to be on the level of homicides, killing one another rather than full-out warfare. Um, there may be some arguments and disputes about that, but that's the most common belief. Um, and generally, those kinds of homicides would then be resolved by negotiation between the bands um, and some kind of penalty. Um, some kind of um, restitution for what, what happened. Though, like I said, that does not mean that these are entirely peaceful. And if a band tries to move into someone else's territory, that probably would result in violence. These communities were probably reasonably egalitarian. 
and that means they're, they're largely equal among people. And a major reason for that is they couldn't afford to have anyone who was a full-time specialist. Rather, whether that's a full-time specialist as a leader, a full-time specialist as a tool maker, a full-time specialist as a healer or a midwife, the reality of it is for the community to survive, everybody has to produce food. Now, if you're very good at a special tool or talent, you're going to be honored for that. If you're someone who people see as a particularly wise leader, you may be the person who's turned to in times of, times of crisis. If you were known as someone who's a particularly good hunter, you might be the one who organizes other men in hunting and you would be given extra respect for that. If you're known as the greatest tool maker, people probably would give you gifts so that you would make special tools for them. If you're the woman who is known as the best midwife to help other women giving birth or, or healing, um, once again, you're probably going to get extra respect, you're going to get extra benefits possibly, but the reality is no matter how good you're at that, you're going to have to spend some of your time producing food. So you can't have any kind of a permanent elite because the community just can't produce enough food to support it. There's no surplus there for that elite to live off of. They have to produce food themselves. These are also pretty, these bands, by the way, were also pretty um, loose in the sense that it usually probably was easy enough if you decided that you wanted, your family wanted to leave, you didn't like the way things were going, you know, you could pack up and leave and take your family and find another band to join in, maybe go to your wife's relatives or something like that. Um, so they're, they're relatively loose, relatively informal, and probably having a leader of the community probably changed depending on if they needed a leader at a given time and what kind of a crisis they were dealing with. So let's say you're facing a hard winter, the, lead, the best leader for that might be someone who is seen as having particular knowledge in finding food, whereas if you're in a situation of a confrontation, well, maybe the leader for that is someone who is known as a particularly good fighter or hunter. These communities depended on having a low birth rate. And that's because, you know, if you realize you're living in communities of about 40 people, you can't absorb a huge generation of kids that is going to sort of double your population. More than that, there's a limit how much a mother can, can raise another child. So in order to keep that child safe, you have to carry that child with you as you're going. If you have two small children who are not old enough to walk, physically, you can't carry them both. So if you have a second baby too soon, you've got a choice there. Are you going to put the older one down and stop carrying them before they're really safe and able to walk? Or are you going to not take the, the youngest? Um, for the most part, they probably manage a low birth rate in, in part simply by the fact of um, prolonged nursing. Hunter-gathered forager mothers probably nurse for, for three or four years often. It depends, of course, on the society. Um, and that's enough in a situation where she's not getting a lot of extra food that she's probably not going to have, for the most part, the energy or the nutrients to get herself pregnant during that time period. Um, so it would be reasonably unlikely for that, um, given the realities of mobile life. Think of, female act, think of female athletes who, when they're working really, really hard and have no spare surplus fat, surplus, um, who stop having their periods. Somewhat like that with nursing. That, by the way, does not work in our society where we have all the surplus fat we need and you can get pregnant while you're still nursing. Um, but, so that would, that would probably help. Um, the reality is, is that a very large number of, of infants probably died, maybe 40% or so, depending, once again, on the society, the living conditions. In the case where you had another child before you were done nursing the first. There may have, in some societies, they may have practiced some form of infanticide. Um, simply because 
the question at that point becomes, you can't care for two. And so are you going to sacrifice the child who has already made it out of infancy and has already survived those odds of 40% of or so dying? Or are you going to sacrifice the child who you don't know their, their survival ability? You know, so are you going to kill your older child for the new one? And in some cases, the question was no, they weren't. And so infant, infanticide may have been a possibility. Having said all that, um, hunter-gatherer communities still tended to be often, um, at least the modern ones, are frequently fairly child-oriented and a strong emphasis on raging, raising children, um, giving them a fair amount of independence, giving them a lot of nurturing and support and attention. Um, and probably the evidence suggests that, that mothers who are raising children probably got some support from fathers, but also from grandmothers, sisters, other women as well in the community that probably goes along with the having fewer children. And so that, that the children who survive, the children who manage to grow up, are going to be particularly prized and loved. Ceremonies and art. Okay, if, if, if art, according to some people, is seen as sort of one of the pieces of evidence of culture, of, of human societies, we know we have some evidence of its existence. There are rock paintings. There are burials where people are buried with various different types of objects, which undoubtedly have some kind of spiritual significance. There are statues that were made, though we don't really know what they were done with them. Some people will say they're children's toys. Some people argue that they're actually religious icons. It's, it's really hard to know. And in fact, probably a lot of art was, was body art, transportable art, um, possibly tattooing, piercing, other ways of altering your physical form was probably an art form. And also creating music, dance, um, all of those things that would be easy to manage in a, in a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, easy to maintain, easy to take with you but from our point of view, is really not going to show any records that we, several thousand years later, would be able to find out and see. So that was the Paleolithic, and that was the way of life for human beings for the majority of human history. And it's also the one that we've moved away from. And if you want to get a sense of just how an extreme of change that is for the world, if you look at this map, that whole area in green, not the neon green at the uh, the upper poles, but that whole area in the moderate greens was originally hunter-gatherer territory as late as 8,000 years ago. That area in the darkest green were hunter-gatherer territory 1,500 years ago. Actually, 1997, the hunter-gatherer territory were those little red dots. And I think today, if you were to look at it, we would actually see even fewer of those dots out there. So it's a way of life that once dominated our history, but has now disappeared. And so next we're going to move on to what replaced the Paleolithic, the Neolithic.